I talk very fast. We're going to try to get back on schedule. Sorry for the delay and the, the trouble with the slides. Um, Gabby, thank you for the presentation before this. That was amazing. And I feel like teed up what we're going to talk about here, which is kind of the planning side of all of the things that you were talking about. So I'm excited to follow, follow that up. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Colleen Johnson. I am the CEO of ProConban.org and the co-founder of Scatterspoke.com, which is a tool for online retrospectives. Um, really, my most important job is mama to these three. My husband's wrangling this week while I am here with you guys. So that's been a fun, a fun trip for me um, and a fun break. <laughs> um, I am from Denver, Colorado, where we have a, a, a very thriving Agile community um, and have been really active there in helping organize the Mile High Agile conferences and Agile Denver meetups. Um, but it's really exciting to, to be traveling again and see everybody in person and meet a lot of you for the very first time. So today, we're going to talk about road mapping, which is the bane of my existence. Um, and I want to start with um, this slide that we've all seen a million times, right? This is, these are our Agile values. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, working software over um, comprehensive documentation. So we've seen, we've seen these a million times. But the one that I think matters most is responding to change over following a plan. And when we talk about all of these new ways of working, whether it's Scrum or whether it's Kanban, um, we look at all of these things as a way to deliver, but we never really address the fact that we're still planning the way we did 20 years ago. We get a group of people together, we roadmap out for the year. Um, that roadmap's typically out of date before we can leave that room. But we still keep doing it this way. Um, we don't spend a lot of our energy getting really great at responding to change. And I think that when we think about how much energy and money and effort goes into these plans, it's really probably one of our biggest wastes as an organization. So this is just a short list I came up with of things I know that change all the time. Um, you know, I used to travel all the time for work. I haven't been traveling quite as much lately. And I always have this funny, funny thing that happens with my husband where I wait till the last minute, I get to the airport, I always call him in a panic because my flight has been changed and I'm freaking out. I'm like, I'm going to get there late. Now my plans are messed up. And he's like, why are you so mad? Every time you travel, your flight's delayed. Every time you figure it out. And I think the reason I panic so much is because all of a sudden I've lost control. And I think that's why, as an organization and as people, we put so much effort into creating these plans. It gives us this sense of control. But when we think about it, it's a very false sense of control, right? We put all this effort and energy into trying to control something that we know is ultimately going to change or be wrong. So when we think about this from a business perspective, right, there's all these barriers to entry for, for um, new businesses coming in and competition in the market and changing things from COVID like Gabby talked about. Um, we benefit from all of this change as the customer, right? We, this competition drives all of these businesses to be more responsive to what we want as consumers. Um, but this also has to drive the businesses to be more than, you know, more than just, um, like you said, deliver, you know, we can't just deliver fast. We have to deliver what the customer wants which means we have to get really good at changing and adapting to their needs. So when I think about roadmaps and I think about working with a lot of the customers where I've coached, coached on the product side of the house, one of the things that they always tell me is we have to have a product roadmap for our customers. Our customers want a product roadmap. And I know lots of other businesses that maybe their customers don't need a product roadmap, but ours are a unique snowflake that require us to tell them what we're going to be delivering a year from now. Um, I always love to challenge this because I bet almost everyone's customers would say, we would rather have what we want when we want it than a roadmap of shit that we're never going to get. <laughs> so I think I, this is always my favorite. Our customers demand the roadmap. So think back. Think back of all the tools you've used. Have you ever seen a, a roadmap from some of your favorite tools? Have you ever looked at Spotify's roadmap? Have you ever looked at your, bank, you know, your banking app's roadmap? Probably not but you expect those tools to adapt to your needs quickly. So I would challenge that your customer is not a unique snowflake either, right? We, they don't care how much time we spent researching or how much time we spent delivering. They just care that they get the solution that they want and when they want it. So if our goal here is that 
we want to respond to our customers and make sure that we're giving them what they want when they want it, how are we going to do this? Um, it's really important that we understand relevant timing to them. We need to know that when they want something, what is immediate to them, right? It's probably not six months from when they want it. It's probably not 18 months from when they want it, which pro would probably even be a pretty optimistic roadmap for most of our organizations. Um, they want something small and something nimble so that they can see that change right away. One of my favorite stories was I was working with an organization that did um, web and audio conferencing before Zoom, and we did not have a way to push video. And so we had a, a team that came together and said, OK, we're going to introduce this way to play videos back in your presentation so you can pause it, you can talk over it, I can push a poll and ask questions, and the video and audio will stay in sync for, ev for everyone watching. And so we got a team together, all the best developers, got them working on this, this new feature. And, and so Flash support changed in the middle of this project. We had to start the whole thing over. Fast forward 18 months. It took us 18 months to release this ability to play a video in your, in your presentation. And no one used it. And we had a big party for the team. We had hats printed. We had a, you know, a keg and a bar where you could put waffles and, and bacon into your waffles. And we were like, why isn't anyone using this feature? We were so excited to launch this feature. So we reached out to customer support and said, could you please call some of these, these folks that asked for this ability to play the video clips back? No one's using this. And they started calling some of the customers who had requested it. And the customers were like, that's not what we wanted. Why would we, why would we want to upload a YouTube clip into our presentation? We wanted to take this section of the presentation that we do all the time and replay that part, right? So taking prior, like almost taking a clip from your Zoom recording. So we missed the mark in a very epic way. We spent a ton of money and a ton of time de developing the wrong feature. And we really lost a lot of goodwill, not just from the customers, but from the developers that worked on that project. I think that's the hardest thing to recover, too, right? So when we think about this need to respond to customers, what we really need to be able to do is get, that, get those small batches, small pieces in front of the customers quickly so we can get feedback from them and respond to what they see. So let's go back to our roadmaps. What, when we think about a roadmap, who still uses roadmaps in their organization? Okay, seems like most, yeah. Okay, so when we think about those roadmaps, let's talk about what's not in there. What's not in your roadmap? I think there's a couple core things. Um, typically, visibility is missing from these roadmaps, and we'll go through each of these. Um, a lot of times, even when you think about visibility, that seems very simple and obvious, but do you know where your roadmap is stored? Do you know how frequently it gets updated, <laughs> right? Does, does everyone in your organization know how to access it? Probably not. It's usually like kept lock and key by a small group of people somewhere, right? Um, reality is often missing from these roadmaps. We plan, but we don't look at all at what's actually happening from a delivery cadence with the teams. Responsiveness, so we plan those features out so far in advance that um, you know, we don't have the opportunity to respond to things as they change and as they happen. Um, space. And so uh, Gabby also talked a lot about looking at data to help us drive what we're going to do next, right? How do we use that feedback coming in to help us have decisions or make better decisions? You need space in your roadmap to be able to do that. And then the last one here is just actual agility, right? <laughs> if we're planning out two years worth of features to deliver, we're not really being very agile. We're not giving ourselves that opportunity to respond to change. If we connect this back to lean thinking and say the core idea of lean is to reduce non-value added items or wastes so that we can increase customer value, all of this planning starts to really look like a waste. So let's talk a little bit about how we can start to apply these things. It's probably no surprise from my introduction here that I'm going to leverage practices from Kanban to talk about how we can apply some Kanban to our product planning cycle. Let's start with visibility. So um, maybe just create a board, right? When we start thinking about a board and um, your definition of workflow here, it may be an epic or a portfolio level in your organization. Um, this is always one of my, you know, it sounds very simple, right? How does an epic move from idea, maybe testing out these small ideas to delivery? When we think about this, it seems simple and obvious. This is always one of my favorite workshops to run with a group of product managers or engineering leaders. 
um, you know, marketing folks are great in this conversation because no one can agree on what this flow looks like. And that's kind of a big, big red flag, right? If we don't know how work moves from, from idea to delivery. So start there, just get this group of people together and say, what is our process for having an idea, validating that idea, committing to doing that work, and then delivering that work to our users? And how do we start to make that really visible? I mentioned too, a lot of product roadmaps get created and then filed away and we never look at them again. One of my favorite things about starting to make this process really visible is all the questions you're going to get. Probably questions you didn't want. <laughs> um, when I think a lot about when we, when we talk about um, priorities changing or shifting, a lot of times we like to say that that's because of um, the hippo, right? The highest paid person's opinion or executives swooping in and changing direction on us. A lot of times that happens because we can't see what's going on. They don't know what the trade-off is when they come and say, stop working on this, pick this up instead. So as soon as we start to create more visibility into that process, we can have a better conversation about that trade-off. This also helps us um, understand what's next, right? This is, I think, one of the things I hear from developers most frequently is they don't like Agile because we spoon feed them stories and they have no idea where we're going, right? They do one story at a time, chipping away. When we start to create this visibility, we can see where we're going next, what's happening after that, what's the big picture strategy for us as an organization. So start simple. Let's start by making this whole thing visible. But if we're going to make it visible, it has to reflect reality. Um, I think this is the biggest hole in what often happens in our product roadmaps is we plan out all these features, but we're never actually saying, how much work do we typically get done, right? And so when we start to create this, this view of everything that's in flight, we're going to get a real picture of not just how much work do we typically get done, but how long does that typically take us? How many of you use cycle time to track your user stories? You know your, how long things typically take? How about for epics? Not as many, right? And so why? Why aren't we tracking epic level cycle time? That's such an interesting thing for us as a business to know because it's also going to help us plan how much work we can get done in a given period of time. So when we start to look at how much work is in each of these states from an epic perspective, we want to start thinking about um, how is work going to move through this system and how much space do we have to, or capacity do we have to pull in those, those new items. Um, I think this is critical, right? When we, when we plan out all this work, and what's often missing from it is accurate starts and stops, right? The minute one thing in the roadmap is late, everything in the roadmap is late, which usually happens right away. If we're looking at a more realistic picture of what's in flight, how much work is remaining, and tracking time against those items, we can start to plan more realistically with our customers about when something's going to be delivered. And so as things start to move downstream in your flow here, we want to start looking at what's next to pull in. And this is the part that's also missing from our roadmaps, is the ability to pick something right when it happens so that we can respond just in time. Um, when we think about this responsiveness, the ability to select what you're going to work on next or select just in time, I think is critical to that ability to respond to change. Um, we spend so much time trying to plan everything that it's often very difficult for an organization to shift directions. And it's usually more because we've spent so much money doing all that planning, we don't want to give it up, right? No one wants to be like, this plan isn't valid anymore. We've spent too much time, time and energy trying to plan out what we're going to build next. So we're just going to keep going with it, even if it's not the right thing for us anymore. And, and as, as this ability to start looking at things more just in time is going to give us the ability to say, what's the right thing based on what we just delivered, based on what we just learned? So you're creating this pool of options to say, we have a couple different things that we could look at building next. Let's wait and see what our customers say and what they think about what we've delivered to pick the next thing. Um, your runway and your time to deliver all of your features or epics is going to vary for everything you work on. And so accepting that and getting good at that is really giving us that opportunity to respond to change. Next, we need some space. So, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, when I was in college, I studied in, in South America and Chile. And they call the, the crazy traffic jams that happen there a taco. 
because everything's packed so tight you can't get into the roadway. <laughs> and so when you think about what we often do here is we create a feature taco. We've packed everything in so tight there's no room for anything new to come in. And so what you want to do when we start thinking about this from a more adaptive perspective is create some space. So if you have one big initiative or one big project that you're working on, maybe one or two epics go out and you switch to a different one while you're giving yourself a chance to see what happens. Instead of stacking all of those epics and features so close together, um, think back to that video clip story, right? If we had put one small thing out and got feedback from customers that said, this isn't what we meant, we would have had a chance to adapt. But because we packed everything all into one big delivery, we didn't have a chance to respond. We didn't have time to learn. Um, and you know what this typically means, which I, might be something that the product world doesn't want to hear, is that we probably need to throw out what we think about MVP and the term MVP. Um, you know, we tend to pack MVP so full of features because it feels like our, our one shot to get everything out the door. So we, we bloat MVP with all this stuff instead of saying, what's one small thing we can get out and learn from? Um, even in the most rigorous process I've seen around capturing, defining, defining metrics, um, I think what often happens is we gather all this user feedback and then we don't do anything with it. <laughs> so what's really important here, and that's like, I don't know, it's like collecting beanie babies. You're just gathering data for the sake of having data. So what can we start to do to say we're going to wait when we put something out in front of our customers and gather that feedback from them to learn what we're going to do next? Um, I think this is a critical thing that organizations really struggle with because it seems like we have to get everything done all at once. And so being able to step back and say, how do we introduce some space into what we're building so that we've got time to adapt and respond? So let's, uh, let's talk about the things maybe you won't miss from your product roadmap. Um, my favorite is the added buffer. Has everybody seen this where we ask the developers how long this will take and then we add 30% for no reason. Um, that's my favorite. Uh, I also love, I, I'm a big fan of Gantt charts, um, the constant changing, having to disappoint everyone in the organization when we tell them it's wrong. Um, there's all this stuff, right? And, and when we think about how all of this adds up, think about that airport example, right? I'm panicked because my flight is delayed, but I have no control over this. This is what we're doing to the teams we're working with. We're creating a plan that they're never going to be able to deliver against. They're never going to be able to hit that target. It hurts morale. It hurts the relationship they have with the customers. It hurts the relationship they have with their product team, right? They feel like they're being held to something impossible. So when we start to get rid of the red light, you know, red light, yellow light, green light status of all these projects or your Gantt chart for your roadmap, and we start to create a more responsive way of responding to our customers, we're also really empowering our teams to take control over that delivery. I think all of this starts to look like really more complete product management. You know, we, we talk a lot about the product managers getting really close to the customers and understanding what problems they're trying to solve. This really empowers a product manager to do exactly that, to work with their team to deliver something, to take a step back and learn from what they've delivered, and then figure out what to work on next. So we're really moving them away from what often feels just like glorified project management with a different name, right, into really being able to understand their customers and respond to their customers' needs. I'm trying to go fast because I know we've got, <laughs> we got a late start. Um, when we also think about this, I think what, when I've seen this work the best in organizations, um, we really get to see the teams be very self-managing too. So um, we can, uh, the teams really start to own the products. And so when the teams have a chance to say, here's what we delivered, um, and ask the product managers, tell me about the metrics. What's happening with this thing we shipped? What should we do next based on how this is performing you know, in production? We're really getting the teams close to the problems that they're solving. Um, I've almost seen this like backfire for some product managers where they get like annoyed with their teams because they're like, stop asking me for data. That's all they do is collect data from production. Um, but that's a pretty amazing place to be when your teams are that excited to understand what's happening for their, for their end users. Um, when we think about this process, you know, we always say business owns the why, right? So they focus on strategy, they focus on objectives, and we look at things like, how does this fit with the big picture? Product usually brings the what, the needs and the outcomes. 
And then the team defines how. The team's going to define how do we hit these targets. But when we think about all of this, what's really important is that we keep these sizes small, right? The bigger the thing is, the longer the runway for you to get feedback, you're losing that ability to respond, you're losing that ability to have space and pivot to something else. So when we think about this process, we wanna always make sure we're getting the team close to the why so that they understand what it is, what's our goal and objectives. And then when we start to carve up the what, we're getting those things small so we can iterate quickly. Small is really the key to everything we're talking about here from a, from a quick feedback loop perspective. So we wanna frame, frame this box for the team, help them drive towards hitting those small batches and then get out of their way. Um, when we think about these responsive roadmaps, uh, I think it's really important that we get executive leadership involved in this, right? So um, some of the most successful implementations I've seen of, of portfolio Kanban like this have had the C-suite doing stand-ups around this board once a week, um, and executive leadership really checking in to say, where are things at? Um, I've even had, you know, we had to have rules at one organization around the um, chief marketing officer kept putting cards in the backlog. So we had to create policies around who could put cards into the backlog at, a, at an epic level. But creating this visibility really starts to drive amazing conversations. You're getting the right people there talking about what's next, what are we learning from, what thing do we need to pick. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect right away. So even just starting with that simple visibility so that you can start to have these conversations and pull things out of your Gantt chart, start to get them visible to everybody. I know everybody is distributed now. Miro is a great way to start, you know, if we can't have physical boards because we're not in an office at the moment. But what we want to make sure here is that that planning process of trying to figure out what we're going to de develop and deliver for the year isn't something that's going to hinder our ability to respond to change and respond to our customers. So the last, the last element we talked about here was agility. Agility is what's missing from your product roadmap. Our ability to, you know, if we backtrack and just talk even about the word agile, right? We always say it's nimble, it's, it's supple, we can respond quickly, right? Um, all these things are really missing from that product planning process the way we're doing it right now. So how do we start to say, let's get small things in front of customers, Let's use data to respond and pick what we're going to work on next and give us that space and flexibility in between what we're working on as a team so we can deliver quickly. So let's say goodbye. Let's say goodbye to our product roadmap. Um, and you know, I think what's interesting when we, we also talk about road mapping is um, budgets typically come up in the roadmaps, right? And so there's a lot of shifting organizationally that has to happen to make this work well. Um, but moving to budgets by teams or programs is usually a great first step. And then making that work really visible so you can start to have that conversation. I try to tiptoe into doing both, right? You can't rip this Band-Aid right off. Um, but if you can start to show something like this portfolio Kanban alongside of what you're doing in your roadmap, you can start to show the discrepancies between what's being planned for and what's actually happening. So if you can do a little bit of both, it's usually a great way to start to get some visibility and somebody going, hmm, all that work we were supposed to start in Q2 still hasn't started and we're going into Q3 because everything's delayed. What should we do? What should we change, right? Um, and you know, I think when we start to think about this, don't forget we want to embrace that this, this, this is one of our agile values, our ability to respond to change. So how do we get good at doing that? You know, get good at, at the fact that things are going to change constantly instead of um, fighting against it. We are going to be coming out with a new class in July all about Portfolio Kanban through Pro Kanban. If anybody is interested, let me, Pratik, Dan know. Um, we'll be really excited to start working through how to help other organizations implement things just like this.